Bullshit. The No BS Marketing Show is brought to you by Larimer's Men's and Women's Designer Clothing. Free shipping, free returns. Shop Men's and Women's Designer Clothing, shoes, accessories, jewelry, and more online at larimores.com or in-store downtown Pittsburgh. It's the No BS Marketing Show. I'm Dave Mastovich. Our guest today is Dave Monar of Tri-State Capital Bank. But first, let's hit the bullseye. Holiday shopping is heating up, and so is the YouTube kid influencer marketing efforts of the toy companies. Say what? 32% of kids said they prefer watching videos on a non-TV device, according to eMarketer Research. Nickelodeon and the Disney Channel both have seen a more than 50% decline in kid viewership the last 10 years. Toy companies noticed and continue to move marketing dollars from traditional advertising during cable TV programming to social media as kids' viewing habits have changed. Part of the toy company's strategy is to reach what they call, quote, kid influencers on YouTube. In the past five years, kid influencers on YouTube have gained notoriety and driven toy sales by posting videos of themselves unboxing and playing with toys and then reviewing them. Toy companies like MGA Entertainment and Larian follow these influencers online with the goal of reaching potential customers through them. Investing in creative ways to put toys in kid influencers' hands. One family of five siblings call themselves kid toy testers, and they'll earn $140,000 this year from toy companies for posting their videos. Mattel has shifted 50% of its marketing spend to digital, while MGM and Larian have moved even more of their dollars there, close to 80%. The toy companies have engagement teams that build direct relationships with kid influencers. So imagine these kid influencers, your prime is probably like age 7 to 13. (laughs) Then you're done. You're over the hill. It works, too. In a PricewaterhouseCoopers research report, YouTube is ranked as the most influential social media platform for 72% of young Generation Z consumers. So everybody talks about the millennials, but Generation Z is following them up, and they said they're far more likely to buy a product if an influencer they follow shares a positive review or uses that product on social media. It comes down to believability and authenticity. And you'll hear me talk a lot about how authenticity is the key and grabbing attention in today's marketing. Kid influencers aren't seen as celebrity endorsers, even though they've achieved notoriety. And they interact directly with fans through social media. They communicate directly with their fans so they aren't acting like celebrities of previous generations of kids. Toy companies analyze engagement, comments, likes, shares across various platforms. The toy company's goal is to match brands with influencers to increase engagement and ultimately toy sales. That's how the toy companies hit the bullseye. Our guest today is Dave Monar, President Commercial Banking for Tri-State Capital Bank, a $4.5 billion bank headquartered in Pittsburgh with regional offices in Cleveland, Philadelphia, Edison, New Jersey, and New York City. Dave started off episode one by walking us through his career background, started off going to IUP, and IUP ended up landing him because he was accepted to both Penn State and IUP. Penn State wanted to send him to Penn State Altoona Branch Campus. He said, "Ah, I'm going to give IUP a try. He had a phenomenal experience. He started out thinking maybe accounting, ended up going with finance, worked through it for four years, and during his senior year, lands a job with Mellon Bank during his last semester. So he knows he's coming into Mellon. They then put him through what is an amazing rigorous and beneficial training program where he spent six months at one branch office focused on one aspect, then nine months focusing on the consumer side at another branch, then another nine months focusing on commercial. Then he becomes part of a commercial credit training program for the mid-market for 18 months. 
This leads to him being able to work with a number of clients in Atlanta, and then he hits the Big Apple in New York City, and he ends up working in New York City, gains a ton of valuable experience there, but then jumps to run offices in Washington, D.C. All of this for Mellon Bank. Comes back to Pittsburgh and leads a team there that starts out with four, hires another four. He's in this position for seven years, continually growing, and gaining valuable experience, but citizens bought the traditional mid-market business, so he jumped to an M&A group uh, at Mellon, ended up being a little bit controversial. He wasn't sure whether he made the right call. We had some things happen, and uh, Citizen moves away with his previous team, but he ends up making a major leap after being at Citizens for a little while to Tri-State Capital Bank, where he ends up working with three founders directly, and it just totally inspires him. He's at the point where he's at the top of his career doing something he loves. He mentioned his mentor, uh, Chuck Gennaris uh, of Vistage, when he joined Vistage four years ago and how that has helped him. He also mentioned how learning from his dad, who ran Monar Upholstery for 60 years, and his dad taught him about relationship management and engagement. So he applied all of that throughout his lengthy career on the banking side. Dave Monar, welcome to episode two. Thanks, Dave. Did I get that somewhat right? I, I, I put your life before your eyes in about a minute and 12 seconds. Yeah, it's pretty good. Thank you. All right. What do you think about kid influencers and a family of five kids making $140,000 as they try to hit the bullseye? Wow. Um, it's very interesting. I think that uh, today's world is so different than it had been in previous years. Uh, my son just graduated with a chemical engineering degree from Purdue. Jumped into a nice big job, uh, doing great. Within you know eighteen months now, he's been promoted a half dozen times or something, something crazy. And uh, I just think kids today just have so much more motivation um, to to succeed, to do what they want to do, to influence outcomes. Uh, versus back in the day, I think a lot of time I was certainly guilty of just riding along, going with the flow. And uh, luckily, some develop, uh, opportunities developed for me, and I was able to seize them and, and grasp them. But uh, today's world is so dramatically different. Technology has changed everything. And the people that are on top of that technology really have a lot of opportunities. The communication aspect of the Internet changed changed every generation from this day forth because now you see possibilities. Up until the Internet, until the mid-'90s, you did kind of – have some self-limiting beliefs, but they weren't that far off. You would go like, you kind of knew uh, there were ceilings or much more ceilings. You just didn't know what was out there. You didn't know the aspect of being able to communicate across the world or across the country. And you just didn't have the opportunity. It's so much easier now to try your own passion, whatever that is. And here's a great example. Kids were reviewing toys on their own. They didn't sit out and say, I'm going to do this to make money. They're nine. They started reviewing toys and they got followers. And now the toy company comes to them and says, well, would you review this one? And they're thinking, well, I get a free toy. <laughs> well, no, not only do you get a free toy, your, your family's going to make $140,000. Now, that's the extreme case. Most of them are probably smaller. But the point is you can do things that you love because of that communication, which came from technology. Absolutely. Technology just advances things so quickly. I mean, we have dealt with companies for many years that were solid. They go 30 years and all of a sudden something changes and they've got to figure out how to change quickly or go away. Well, let's talk about that for a minute, about uh, sustaining businesses and growing businesses. One of the prevalent themes throughout your uh, career track in episode one and what I just recapped for our listeners who might only be picking up episode two is there's a couple of key things. You talked a lot about relationship management. You led relationship managers. You built relationships yourself. And you talked a lot about lending through those relationships to people that could grow their business. And then you talked about the mid-market. And how that was a lot of times your key target market. I like to ask guests about their big idea, their driving force. When I read Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, I realized that, yes, that was awesome for me as an entrepreneur and a CEO of a company that I had to have our why. I had to explain that to all of my team members and explain it to our clients. And our why is that um, no BS marketing should be something that every company can do. It shouldn't be just the companies that are big, just the elite companies, just because you're UPMC or PNC that you can do real marketing. 
But then I realized after reading that book, that's only half the story because if I go out and pitch to you, Dave Moner, and say, I want you to work with Mass Solutions on marketing, I tell you our why, you go, that's nice. It's kind of cool, I guess. You you're, you have a sort of altruistic thing, but you're like, you move on your way because the second why that has to be answered is there's your why and then there's your customer's why, their reason for buying. So your reason for being their reason for buying. And if you, we help our clients coalesce those two whys into one big idea. And that big idea really can be a driving force that's your reason for being, but then also their reason for buying. And we help companies tell their story. So I don't expect you to have that articulated because we'd like you to hire us to do that. But but what's your personal why? What's the biggest driving force throughout your career that you always keep coming back to? And you're like, that's what makes me tick. That's what makes me go. Well, I don't know about my whole career, but clearly the last 11 years, what has motivated me and excited me is the, the model of tri-state capital. I mean, um, I would say the big idea is dare to be different and always focus on adding value to your client. So you mentioned the word relationship. I, I think there's probably not a bank in this country that doesn't say that they're relationship bankers. You'll see it in their liter marketing literature. You'll see it in their advertisements. They always say that. But to be quite honest, I mean, it's one-sided. It means as a bank, if I make you a loan, you need to buy all these other products from me. I sell insurance now. I, I know you have a good insurance company. It's probably better than ours, but we made you a $5 million loan. You should use our insurance company. And the bankers then can call a full relationship that they have six, eight products sold to a client. From Tri-State Capital's perspective, the relationship banking orientation is from the client's seat and is what can we do as a banker to add value to them and their business. So we're not great at responding to RFPs where somebody's just looking for the lowest rate on the loan, like whether it's a broker or the company themselves, they send you a package and, and basically describe what they're asking for and what's your rate. And uh, we wouldn't win most of those and don't want to win most of those, frankly, it has nothing to do with the relationship. It's playing into the, the long held, uh, theory that banking is a commodity. And what we have tried to do is non commoditize that. And that is get to really know the people, customize products and services, price them, uh, appropriately. And, and a great example is we had a deal that came into us as an RFP. Again, fill in the blank. What's your rate on this deal? Uh, a nice local company was building another building on their campus. And um, our relationship manager who got the RFP basically said, well, we're not going to bid unless we have a chance to meet the people, meet the company. And it was a short list of people. I think there was the existing bank, obviously, the bank that they banked with exclusively for 30 years uh, and a couple other banks that they had identified. And we got in front of the company. And what we did was learn more about them. And found out that just based on the business that they were in and the location where they were, that they might qualify for a special type of financing. So a tax-free issue. And our relationship manager offered to bring an expert, a local lawyer who's an expert in the field, to come out and talk to them. That occurred. They agreed there was a tremendous opportunity for them to go that route. And they basically told us that they had no intention of doing this deal with anybody else but their existing bank. They were just trying to keep them honest by getting some other bids in. But they said, we came to the table with such a unique, customized solution that really was the right option for them that they were giving us the deal. And again, we would have never gotten that opportunity just putting a rate on a sheet and sending it in to see if we would have won the deal. So that's, that's what I think makes Tri-State a little bit different. We really try to be engaged with the clients and the companies and try to Everything doesn't have to fit into a box. We can customize everything we do. So dare to be different um, and, and customize things and, and engage and listen. How does that still work from your ideal customer profile? What's the ideal customer look like? Is it a 20 to $40 million a year company that needs to borrow $10 million? Like, What are some of the thoughts? Yeah, we would say $10 million revenue is sort of the starting point, And we probably would go up to say $300 million in revenue. So the vast majority of that universe are privately held, family-owned type businesses uh, that you probably have been around for, for decades. And it's critical, like I said, that you get in front of them and understand them 
and maybe anticipate their future needs, whether that's buying out some family members out of the ownership, whether that's expansion and trying to get ahead of that story and trying to help them. Because again, what we're looking to do is add value. It could be us introducing them to peers, other customers that we have that we think could help them in a certain area uh, and get engaged. Uh, so it, it's all about them. Hey, no BSers, you know I love Larimer's men's and women's designer clothing. It's time for you to take your look to the next level. Larimer's is the place to make it happen for you. How do I know? Because they've helped me for years. You talk about combining professionalism and style. That's what happens when you go with Larimer's. You can shop online at larimer's.com or in-store in downtown Pittsburgh. We're with Dave Molnar, president of Commercial Bank for Tri-State Capital. He just talked about how Tri-State Capital, he he's excited because he thinks that their model is his big idea, and he's been at it for a while with Tri-State and watched th that company grow. He said they dare to be different. They add value to the client. They are engaging and listen, and their ideal customer we just mentioned is a privately held, family-owned business, $10 million to all the way up to 300 million in size where they can come in and become a key strategic partner and help that company grow and achieve their goals. Dare to be different and add value to every client. Dave, you said that the tri-state opportunity from a leadership standpoint has been uh, one of the most invigorating for you. Talk about how you've communicated with clients, peers, and up and down the chain at tri-state from a communication standpoint, what has worked well with Tri-State since that's the place where you felt the most comfortable or you've got to be the most you, the, the best Dave Molnar? What are, what are some of the communication approaches, communication strategies that you've used and that have worked well at Tri-State? Well, the vast majority of, of my team is outside of the Pittsburgh area. So it involves a lot of video conferences, a lot of phone calls, a lot of text messages and emails. But I talk to them every single day uh, in each of the markets, trying to get updates on current activities, trying to find out where we can add value. Uh, the senior management team at Tri-State has no problem in going out into those markets to join call with those officers in those markets to try to, again, sell the Tri-State story, uh, sell the relationship that we can provide, and, and win customers one by one. And that's what we've done. I mean, we haven't made any acquisitions to get the four and a half billion of assets has just been adding one customer at a time. Give, give the audience a tool that you use to help you become more productive or to help you communicate better. We've had guests offer these tools and we, we actually make a list of them and talk about them. We've even do, done some compilation episodes with multiple tools in them because our, our listeners tell us from time to time, wow, this guest said this and I hadn't tried that. What's a tool that you think might help our listeners? Well, I certainly have read a lot in terms of um, self-awareness, uh, self-improvement. I kind of tend toward authors who are more former CEOs and been in there versus the academic type and the research type. Um, and I usually try to get one or two key things out of, of a book or out of a speech or whatever. Uh, it, it's interesting. I, I heard uh, you know Mike Sullivan give a speech just the other day, and uh, the theme was six uh, ideas that help businesses succeed. And he was relating it really to managing the penguins. And the two things that really hit me uh, were chemistry. That's the first thing he said: chemistry. And when you think about chemistry in a hockey team, you certainly understand what that means. But in an organization, it's really important. The culture that we build at Tri-State is extremely important. Again, it's a little bit non-traditional banking. So as we interview people, we want to make sure we're inter um, bringing on somebody who's entrepreneurial, somebody who would like to get the handcuffs taken off a little bit from the organizations maybe that they've been at, less bureaucracy, ability to get things done. Uh, you know, again, establish strong relationships with clients that they know they can perform. So I, I, I think that that was really important culture and hiring the right people, getting the right people in the right seats. Uh -huh. So that was one of the things. And the second thing he talked about that I thought was important was process. Uh, he talked about defining your process, knowing your process, and being very comfortable in the process. And don't be short-sighted. Don't look at short-term results and, and panic. That if you think you've identified the right process and you've got buy-in, just keep working at it and you will be successful. 
Excellent. Excellent. How how do you consume content? I like to ask all the guests how they consume content. So I'm just going to throw up a bunch of things and let you answer. So there is uh, getting up in the morning and reading what you read first. Is that a set couple of blogs? How, what's your content aggregator? Do you go to certain websites? Second thing is, are you an audible person where you listen to books online? Are you a podcast listener where you consume audio on demand? Do you go to a lot of workshops? I know you have the Vistage workshops. Um, what are, do you read hardcover books? Do you read paperbacks? I love to hear how people consume content. Selfishly, it helps us at Mass Solutions to try to position how we can get people to reach people like you. But I also just like to hear because I can learn and tweak my consumption patterns. Well, clearly, you know, the first thing I do every morning is read the Wall Street Journal, see what's going on in the world. Now you read it online? Uh, I, I, I have both. I, we, we get hard copy. And then if I'm traveling, it's easier to obviously read it online. Um, and there are so many websites out there, so many organizations that you, you sign up for and you get a monthly newsletter, a weekly newsletter. Uh, there's interviews with key people. Uh, I've, I've got so many of those. It's, it's incredible. And uh, I like that because, to me, consuming two or three pages of a synopsis is so much easier than, than bringing out a 400-page book. And sometimes I get a little ADD. I start skipping the book. But I think it's getting a little slow trying to get to the answer. Um, so I, I like the abbreviated summaries that come with a lot of this this content that you can sign up for. A lot of banking industry information. The American Banker Association is a daily publication, uh, so I try to stay on top of all the trends, um, you know, regulations, all those kinds of things. So I'm reading constantly. It's always something, uh, whether it's online, whether it's hard copy, whether it's magazines, uh, internal uh, sort of publications. Uh, a lot of things. Any other advice for the, the the listener related to content consumption? So you gave us a, a couple of great tips on the chemistry culture and process from the Mike Sullivan talk. Is there any of those um, e-newsletters or any other books or anything you'd like to mention that would help our listeners? Well, a lot of them are banking oriented. Uh, again, I, the American Bankers are a great daily publication. Uh, lots of articles, regulations. Uh, things going on in the industry, trends, uh, uh, just a lot of different things that are important for us to stay on top of. Um, but I would just say that gravitate toward what really makes important. And then one of the things we look at is what moves the needle for you. I, I personally sometimes can get buried in minutia. I mean, it's I'm not a natural leader. I've got to get out of my element. I mean, you know from the Vistage, the belief wheel, right? Your DNA is your DNA, uh, and sometimes it creates a bias for you in interpreting uh, you know, the, the outside world, and you've got to sort of separate that and look at things objectively and try to identify opportunities that maybe deep down you wouldn't think of normally. And uh, there's a couple of books that I've read along those lines that try to make sure I do that. That's the one thing I've learned the most over the years is there's a huge difference between a manager and a leader. And it's, you know, I can very easily fall back into the manager role, crossing T's, dotting I's, making sure everything's balanced and, for you know, all the reports are signed off and all that kind of stuff. But in terms of leading, truly uh, leading by example, leading in terms of trying to bring ideas to the table to take us to the next level, um, trying to – and our CEO, Chairman uh, Jim Getz, is always – the idea has to move the needle. You know, we've looked at some things at the, at the bank in terms of um, some additional product line extensions. And, and one in particular, we sat down and talked to Jim and he's like, this is probably $20 million in loans over the next 12 or 18 months. That is, that's nothing for us. We're going to exert all these resources, time, effort, expense. It's not big enough, you know. You identify opportunities that truly make a difference and differentiate you from the competition down the road. Dave Monar of Tri-State Capital Bank, the president of Commercial. Dave, was there anything you thought I'd asked you that I didn't or anything you want to mention? Uh, at one point you talked about sort of marketing successes. Yes. And, and I think the example that I gravitate to is – my first couple of days at Tri-State Capital. So I leave, you know, 25 years of a big bank environment and I go over to Tri-State. The doors are open, but there's no business. There's 20 employees. 
and uh, I had to call a client. A client it wasn't a client yet, actually. They were on the verge of becoming a client. I was about to move them from a very, very big bank to where I was. And I needed to go out and talk to the family to tell them that I was making this move. And I went out and sat down with the, the father and the two daughters and explained that here's what I'm doing personally. And, it, you know, we just opened the doors to TriStep. We had no marketing material. I, I basically went out and told them what the business plan was. You know, the whole idea of trying to merge all the positive attributes of a small community bank with all the sophistication and, and product capability and a size of a wallet from a big bank and bringing able to deliver that to the client. And uh, I put together this five-page pitch book. It's just a quick synopsis. And right at the end, I just put, you know, we're entrepreneurs like you. And the company turned around and said, we want to move the business to you. And I was totally blown away. And uh, they said, everything you described about the organization is perfect for us. This is probably a $40 million revenue company, a 5 or $6 million credit need, local. And it, again, it did dovetail right into our plan. And they, what they said to me was that they were just so afraid to move from one big bank to another big bank, they were just going to have all the same issues in terms of account officer turnover and lack of responsiveness and 800 numbers and things that change at the, at the organization that impact them that they had nothing to do with and on and on. And they felt like this was a, a unique approach. And uh, certainly that customer still with us today, 11 years later. But I, I walked out of that office and I got on the phone calling back to Pittsburgh because it was about an hour outside of town. And I started telling people, we need to figure out how we're going to approve a loan, how we're going to book a loan, how we're going to document it because – That's beautiful. And it just you know, it really rang a bell there to say we had a unique idea. We're entrepreneurs like you. Dave Molnar, thanks for being on the show. Appreciate it, Dave. Enjoyed it. To our listeners, thanks for joining us for the NoBS Marketing Show brought to you by Laramore's Men's and Women's Designer Clothing. Free shipping, free returns. Shop men's and women's designer clothing, shoes, accessories, jewelry, and more online at laramores.com, our in-store downtown Pittsburgh. Visit MassSolutions.biz for show notes plus additional marketing and messaging resources. Sign up for the NoBS Marketing Weekly Update to receive timely, valuable ideas to improve your marketing and transform your message. Remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? And build your story around the answer. It's all about bold solutions, no BS.